So uh, the final topic we're going to look at is what we call association rules mining. It is a topic I find actually quite interesting because of the, the way it's been applied in our real life and sometimes we don't even know that's being applied on us. Um, so association, association rules mining is really just frequent pattern analysis. It's in simple terms, what products do people frequently buy together? Or what other products, products would people buy if they bought something else like a laptop? So you find that supermarkets use this. Um, even in banking, we, we use um, market basket analysis, so frequent pattern analysis, where you try to know what people, what customers typically get together or what products they typically, typically get together. And then you recommend. So you build recommendation systems based on um, frequent pattern analysis. I think an example or one story that might be a myth but is talked about a lot when we talk about association rules mining is the story of, of diapers and beer where people learned that apparently guys in, in a certain age group used to go to a particular supermarket, I don't know if it's Target or if it was Walmart, to buy diapers and they ended up buying beer as well. So there are two decisions that you can make with this particular information. So you can either put the diapers close to the beer in the different aisles. You can either put them close to each other so that when a guy comes in to buy diapers, he knows that he has to buy beer. Or you can put them very far apart so that they go through different aisles and pick other things while they look for their beer or their diapers or and their diapers. So on the screen, I have an example of Amazon. Now, Amazon uses this a lot. Um, they may use different recommendation methods, but it's, you know, it's still, uh, they're still looking for patterns in the things that we buy. So if we've bought something on Amazon, you'll notice that they'll, they'll show you what is frequently bought together. So if you go and look for, say, a laptop, it might show you that, you know, guys frequently buy a laptop bag and a mouse together with a laptop, right? Um, so even when you're buying books, it will show you that, you know, this book is also frequently bought with this other book and this book as well. And in most cases, you'll actually click and buy that stuff. So this is an example um, of, of Amazon probing us or showing us things that are typically bought together. And it also shows you that customers who bought this also bought this, right? So you also, it probes you to look at that particular item. And in most cases, or in some cases, you actually go to that item and buy it. So it's really just a recommendation, um, a recommendation, recommendation tool that has been built based on patterns that have been recognized from other buyers who might be similar to you. So I mentioned this market basket analysis this is just a very simple example to show um, how market basket analysis works. It's really association rules mining. Um, it's a modeling technique based on a theory that if you buy a certain group of items, you're more or less likely to buy another group of items. So let's look at this example. Imagine we're in a, a supermarket and we have five customers. The first one puts bread, coke, and milk in their trolley. The second one puts beer and bread. The third one puts beer, coke, diapers, and milk in their trolley. You get the gist. So essentially, this data is fed into a market basket analysis, and you come up with rules, like the rules on the right. So it tells you that guys who buy diapers also buy beer. Now, it's very important for us to mention that association is like correlation. It's a measure of co-occurrence. It's, it's not causality. So we can't say having diapers causes someone to buy beers. No, it's just um, co-occurrence, you know, that happens. So we can say guys who have diapers in their trolley are likely to put beer in their trolleys as well. Or guys who have milk and bread are likely to add coke in their trolleys as well. So from the rules that are the results of your market basket analysis, you're either able to see that different items that go together and make a decision on whether you should put these items together um, or if you should do promotions for these items, or it can give you interesting relationships that you've never seen before, like beers and diapers are bought um, together. So you can make still uh, campaigns or you can decide on how to create, how to organize your store based on the different results that you get from your market basket analysis. 
Um, like any other model, there are ways that we can measure our metrics. Uh, so for market basket analysis, there are different things that, or different metrics that come out that will allow us to interpret on whether if whether a rule is interesting or not, or if it's something that we should look at in the first place. So imagine we have X and Y, and these are sets that we have X, we have Y. Um, and the rule that comes out of this, this particular set is X, the arrow Y. And this is inter interpreted as if you buy X, then you also buy Y, of course, with some level of confidence that's given to us by the model. So there are different met metrics that we look at to make decisions based on, um, make decisions about or interpret the model or the results of our algorithm. So that's what we call support. Support of X and Y is really the probability of X and Y. And it's calculated by the count of X, Y, like how many times do X and Y appear together in a basket divided by the total number of transactions that we have or the total number of baskets that we're looking at. That's the support. Uh, the confidence is really probability of Y given X. So probability of Y given X is if we already have X in our trolley, what's the probability that we're going to pick Y as well? Um, so it's a probability of X, Y divided by the probability of X. And then lift is really a combination of both support and, and confidence. And it, it really just helps us see which rules are meaningful and interesting and require us to dig deeper into them. And most times when, uh, when we have a lift of greater than one, then we think that it's a very interesting um, rule. So um, with regards to the, the basket that we're looking at earlier on, uh, with the bread, coke and milk in one transaction, beer and bread in another transaction, how do we calculate support, confidence and lift? So this is just a simple example. Um, the support of, of diapers and beer is the number of times diapers and beer appear in any transaction together. So in these particular five transactions that we're looking at, diapers and beer appear two times, and we have a total of five transactions, so we have a support of 40%. So that means diapers and beer appear in 40% of our transactions or our basket. Um, when we're looking at confidence of still that particular rule, we, the calculation that I showed you earlier on, we get the probability of diapers and beer divided by the probability of beer, and we have a confidence of 66%. So basically you're 66.7% confident that for every diaper transaction, a beer transaction will occur. Then lift, like I said, is a combination of those two calculations. Um, for this particular rule, we have a lift of 1.1 which would tell us that it's an interesting rule. This is not something we expect like bread and jam or peanut butter and bread because we know, we already know that people sometimes purchase this together. This is diapers and beers. It's, very, it's a very interesting rule. I'll go to the code now. Um, with regards to the code, for this particular algorithm, you need to, to um, import a few, um, a few new modules that we've not looked at before from the ML Extend um, family. The data set that we look at is um, a, data, a data set of online transactions at a particular supermarket or a particular franchise. Um, it has 540,000 observations and only eight features. So it's, it's, it's a very big data set. Um, of course, again, like I've been mentioning over and over again, it's very important for us to explore our data just to know what we are dealing with. So at this point, I explore the data and I learn that, okay, I'm dealing with, um, these are the data types that I'm dealing with uh, for the different features that I have. I learn, I also learn that I have different, um, different countries are represented in my data set, okay? Um, I have 2010 data, so my data set is really 2010 and 2011 data. So I also want to see what my um, trend of transactions are like. Not that I'm going to use this particular, this particular information for my market basket analysis, but it just gives me information on the kind of data that I have right now. 
So I see or I notice that um, there's only one month's worth of data for 2010 data and then four months worth of data for 2011 data. So you can either make a decision to get rid of the 2010 data or leave it in. It's really up to you. But this gives you more information about the kind of data you're dealing with. It's very, very important. I also build uh, you know, a time series of some sort to just kind of help me see what people's buying patterns are like in terms of frequency. And you can tell that November has quite a bit of data or there's some growth that happens from August up until November when transactions go down in December. So I can ask myself um, what happened in September? Uh, did they have any campaigns? What products were bought in this period? Why did transactions go down in December? Do I have all the data required for December? This just gives me information about uh, the data set that we're dealing with. I also want to know what country the customers are purchasing from because so many countries are represented. So I write this code, I remove all sorts of duplicates and I can see that the UK is really represented a lot followed by Germany and France. Um, so this might be good information t for me to have or depending on, on the company, you might find that you want to build different market basket analysis models for each country because different patterns might come out from each of the country's data sets. Um, I also noticed that um, some of the data, the quantities are in negatives. And so maybe that means that maybe someone bought something and returned it. And so they had to cancel the order in the system. I also noticed that there are some prices that are zero prices. And so for some of these anomalies that I notice, I remove them from my data set just to make sure that I don't have um, any weird stuff in my data set. One thing you can try, which I didn't do, I mean, I removed the negative quantities, but then they're, they're the positive quantities of these particular transactions because these negatives are just canceling them out. So you would have a task of finding out those transactions and removing them as well from your data set, just so you do not skew your data set. Um, so we go right into the transactions. Another thing we need to do is transform the data set so that each item that has been bought is created into a feature, right? And if a person bought it, it has a one. If it doesn't, if the person didn't buy them, or if they didn't appear in a particular invoice, then it has a zero. One thing I didn't mention is that the original data set that we looked at earlier on had multiple invoice numbers and multiple items, right? So one invoice is highly likely to have many items. So what we've done at this point is we've created a single view of a single invoice and we are just saying, okay, the first invoice, does it have a particular item? Yes or no. Does it have this other particular item? Yes or no. So we change the data set and we transform it. We give it a long format. Um, that's what we're doing here. We're saying if a particular item is, is there in the data set, then give it a one. If it's not there, then let's give it a zero. Um, then at this point, we build, we apply our market basket analysis, our a priori algorithm. It's very simple. It's one line of code. Um, most times you find, or all the time, it's very good for you to in indicate the minimum support that you're looking at. Remember the definition of support, it's the number of times a particular item or combination of items appears in the overall data set. So you want to, to limit those. You don't want to have all sorts of supports or all sorts of rules or relationships coming in that might appear in very few of your transactions. So it's key um, for you to choose the kind of support that you want. What I picked here was a 7% support. And then it gives me the frequent item sets. So what we do is then we use association rules. We have a function called association rules. We give it the frequent item sets that we came up with earlier on. And we tell it, okay, organize these associ association rules by the lift, where you have the highest lift appearing at the top. Um, you organize it in descending order. So you have typical results like this. We have, um, I looked at the head, there might be a few more rules in here but um, this this is what uh, an MBA result looks like you have the antecedents which are 
what you have in your basket first and then the consequence which is what you're likely to put in your basket if you have the antecedent. So looking at the first example, the first row, um, you can easily interpret it as um, a customer who buys an alarm, a pink alarm clock is also likely to buy a green alarm clock. The support of this particular rule is 10%, meaning that it appears in 10% of the transactions or all the transactions in our data set. Um, sorry, it's a support of 7%. So after we've generated um, frequent item sets using the a priori function, um, giving a minimum support of 7%, uh, we apply the association rules function as well. We feed this function with a frequent item set and ask it to use a metric, the lift metric, where it, it organizes the rules based on the lift. So the rules with the highest lift will appear at the top and then you know it will be arranged in descending order. So how we interpret these results, the first row, we can see that the antecedent, which is what you will have in the basket before and the consequent is what comes after whatever it is that you have in the basket. So in this case we can see that or we can say um, one of the rules we found out is customers who buy pink alarm clocks also buy green or tend to put green alarm clocks in their basket as well and this has a support of 7% so it means that it, it occurs in only 7% of our transactions which really is a good support or a high support um, for a very large data set. Um, the confidence is 72.5%, so that just means that we are 72% confident that when a customer puts a pink alarm clock in their basket, they will also put a green alarm clock. Um, I forgot to mention earlier on that for these particular rules, I only looked at France, transactions that happen in France. Um, like I said, you can build different um, MBA results or different MBA rules um, based on a different country so that you can come up with different recommendations for each country. Um, we have a lift of 7.7 seven, seven, which tells us that it's a, it's, a, it's a good interesting rule, I guess. Um, so you can come up with recommendations based on this. Um, at this point in my final chunk, I, I tell, I look for rules that are greater than six and have a confidence of, of more than 80%. Um, so again, we see alarm clocks. So it seems people in France like to buy alarm clocks a lot. I don't know. But um, someone can easily come up with different recommendations based on these rules. Um, we use... All these different algorithms can be used in different industries. Like I mentioned earlier on, I'm in the banking industry and we've used MBA as well to kind of come up with recommendations for different customers. It can be used in retail, it can be used in any FMCG or whatever it is that you're looking at. Um, you can find a way, depending on the problem statement that you've been given, of applying all the different algorithms that we've taught you so far to help answer any different problem that you have. Again, don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions or if you just want to reach out and give me any ideas. I will be sharing my code um, with you guys as well as, so feel free to adjust it or do whatever it is that you want with it, um, as well as the different the PowerPoints that I've used. Um, and then really data science or machine learning or whatever it is you're learning is really just about you putting in the time and the effort to learn these things. Um, pace yourself, give yourself time, uh, eventually these things will come to you. Remember the industry is always changing so you find that you always have to read about the new algorithms that are being used in different cargo competitions and I encourage you to get to participate in the different cargo competitions as well because you find that the different that constant participation kind of gives you an overview of what other guys are doing, the algorithms they are applying and it also helps you learn some of the things that you need to do when you're building a model. So thank you very much. I look forward to meeting you guys at one point in time and I hope you've had fun in these classes. Thank you. <laughs>